Good evening to you and welcome to Voice of Africa Radio. Today, the 9th of March 2015, you still tune in to Voice of Africa Radio. This is your show, Inside This Evening. Elizabeth Jones is in the studio with me, Mahmoud Faiz and Limbit Opek, former uh, MP for Liberal Democrat, is in the studio this evening with me on Voice of Africa Radio. Mahmoud Faiz... Good evening, yeah. sir. <laughs> South Asian expert and human rights activist is also here. Elizabeth Jones. Good uh, evening, Adam. The row by the UK candidate for Dartford has been able to change something for regular visitors at the hospital, Darren uh, Valley, uh, Valley Hospital car park that was going to have a lot of money People were going to pay a lot of money to park there to either attend to their patients, loved ones, and their family in the hospital. Elizabeth, uh, yes, Adam. kindly tell us why you think that you don't want them to have extra 107 uh, parking lots because if we are, they are not going to get that money, that parking lots are not going to be added to the existing parking lot in the hospital facilities. I think there's a bit of a uh, misapprehension there. The 107 extra parking spaces, which will be uh, utilised by Darren Valley Hospital, I believe are already in pe- place as of today, and uh, it's having no impact concerning the lack of parking revenue. Now, what happened about a week and a half ago, Darren Valley Hospital parking, the uh, which is... Uh, organised by uh, an outsourced company, Vinci, uh, wanted to increase its hourly rate from £1 to £1.50 and its 24-hour rate from £5 to £15. Uh, luckily, one of our eagle-eyed members saw the, the increase in the parking charges because they had the old parking charges right alongside the new parking An charges. An hour is £1. And, and it's going to go up to £1.50. Yeah, £1. And for 24 hours, if you're going to be parked there, let's say you've got long-term need or you're visiting someone who's really ill, it would go from £5 to £15. Of course, if if you're a regular user, um, if you're a regular visitor, if indeed you're staff, that's going to start eating into uh, your income quite quickly. So they had the old charges right alongside the new charges. A, an eagle-eyed UKIP member took a photograph. Immediately, we sent it straight off to all the local press. A so UKIP snipper. A UKIP snipper. <laughs> <laughs> well, that snapper. sounds very strange. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. This is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that went, we sent that off to all the media outlets. Immediately, badoomph, immediately. And we thought, well, that's odd. Nothing's turned up. Nothing's turned up in the press. And the next thing then, found out that, in fact, they'd done a complete uh, U-turn. And Darren Valley Hospital and Vinci had decided not to go ahead at all with the increase in parking charges. I think that's because the uh, local status quo, being the um, Conservative MP and the Conservative Labour Council balance, are so worried about UKIP gaining power, gaining a foothold, that they're going to jump through hoops between now and the 7th of May to ensure but that the Mahmoud electorate Faiz is has happy. refused to also, the Liberal Democrats, Leighton and Wanstead, has also refused to capitalise on the advantage of uh, the same incidents in... Uh, one of the hospitals. Well, this was in Hodlack. This was in the in the uh, in the town hall. What happened? The council reduced parking charges for day and evening for park cars. Now, day is fine because you get all the people who are working there or contributing who are being paid to be there. But in the evenings, a lot of time it's just voluntary groups who are helping and benefiting the community. So very proactive, very hard-working councillor by the name of Mahmoud Hussain, who was the Lib Dem councillor of Alstor High Street, actually took the case out with local residents of Prashidam and actually got the park, park totally abolished for the evening. So now voluntary groups can go out there and park there absolutely free due to the hard work of the residents of Walter Forest and councillor Mahmoud Hussain. Well, uh, you still tune into Voice of Africa Radio now on our... Uh, main topics tonight we'll be discussing uh, why is ISIL gaining more popularity and why is a youth who was born and bred in the United States, Britain, Australia or anywhere of the world any part of the world would even think of joining a war that does not even touch his knee why are they getting more support and uh, uh, joining them to fight in Middle East is it that because our 
press has lost everything and they don't have the knowledge of uh, what is happening out there or is it that the security services are also promoting what others are not supposed to have promoted this youth uh, the cage came out with a statement some last two weeks that uh, unfortunately jihadi john a London based university student graduated from Westminster University who is in Syria beheading us was pressurized by the security services to and he even intended to take his own life therefore to do that he has to go to Syria and seek revenge limit uh, are we let down by those who are supposed to guide guard our society and promote the, 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 our own culture and support the youth from not going to places like Syria and Iraq to join ISIL? The, the, that's, in my view, well, the answer would be we want to not promote people to do that. So that's a direct answer. But I'm only saying that because I like to give direct answers. In reality, I think we have created a hornet's nest of radicalism. It sounds to me plausible what this Jihadi John character has said. It's perfectly believable to me that he was put under pressure by the security forces in the United Kingdom to work for them. Now, I don't have first-hand knowledge. I've never spoken to the guy, but I did work in Northern Irish politics when terrorism was a big deal there. And this kind of thing happened. And in that sense, it's not going to be the first time that Britain's secret service has looked for what amount to double agents. Second one, and this is a really big point, we've actually had politicians in this country saying that they want to deny a platform to speak for non-violent extremists. Now think about that. How do we define non-violent extremists and what are the uh, parameters under which one can be banned or one can be uh, classified as a uh, non-violent extremist preacher or a speaker? The the point you make is exactly the one that I would make. I did in fact make it in a book which I wrote called The Alternative View which is still available if anyone wants to buy it. It's a great book and uh, and so I'm not selling my book tonight. Uh, and, And the reason we said it is because exactly that point is central to this. Who defines what extremism is? Who defines uh, why we should eliminate some non-violent extremists from debate and allow others? This is a relative thing. Give you an example. Recently a soldier, a former soldier, was killed. He was fighting in Syria on one side and there's been some fairly positive and sympathetic reports about his death in that theatre of conflict. On the other hand, if people were killed who came from the UK and were fighting for ISIL, for example, they would get a different treatment. So it's almost as if we see the whole thing through a Western filter. Why do I feel strongly about this? Well, I had a debate. Last week I was at a debate with a very senior member of the government and we raised these questions with him and he didn't seem to have an answer to it. I put all that together and I come to this conclusion. This country is willfully ignoring the fact that we could be radicalising people as a result of those kinds of policies, denying a platform instead of having an engagement with those people, uh, creating a positive image for some people who fought on one side in a paramilitary environment and opposing people who fought on the other. Let's remember that this country, to the best of my understanding, was actually quite sympathetic to some of the people who were fighting President Assad. Yeah, I quite remember now, we, 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 we provided non-lethal support to uh, train uh, people to fight Assad as a detector and uh, a bad boy against the Western policy. Therefore, we need to get rid of Assad before everything can be okay. Uh, 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 Turkey open eight borders to these boys who are migrating from United Kingdom, America, Australia, to use their border facility where they c- cut weapons into Syria to support the rebel activity. So why are we now, Elizabeth, yes. saying that these three young girls who decided to go to Syria, they have their right to go to Syria as a, mm, a people, course. they can travel. So why are we now uh, saying that a lot of people are leaving the shores of Britain to Syria to join ISIL? as we 
created the enabling environment allow some people to go because they were going to support the policies of our government to go there now it is attracting people why are we now saying it's not good to go to syria well it's not good to go to syria basically why for those, for those well on a very practical level those three girls could come to for some very serious physical harm many people do get killed in syria so from a practical point of view it's quite dangerous for their uh, future well-being to go in physical terms. Uh, with regard to radicalisation, it's a very complex process. Uh, I don't think that it has anything whatsoever to do with Syria. Um, we've had Muslim on Muslim sectarian violence for many years before 9-11, before 2001 Iraq invasion, before 2003 Iraq invasion. But it wasn't predominantly like what is going on now today that well, uh, courtesy on, Mr. Uh, uh, Obama and Bush clearly define uh, liberal or moderate well, Muslims, which is Shiite and the Sunnis, which we was did, did not Saddam known Hussein. in Iraq. No, it it was. wasn't known in Iraq. No, it was. Because we had, no, it was. Because we had Saddam Hussein did slaughter about 10,000 Shia. Um, there, is, uh, there is a long history of sectarian violence, as there was in Iraq. Which was the Iranian stuff. young men who were fighting Saddam Hussein, who were gassed. And it was used as a pretext to say Saddam Hussein has killed his own people, so we have to go and kill him. But at that time, within the uh, Islamic world, they, I don't think that there was a major um, uh, right movement against that. Now, with regard to radicalization, yes, it is happening. We've got to consider how we uh, stop it or how we contain it. There are some very practical measures. For a start, we can ban all insurance companies from paying ransom. That's a very practical measure. So that cuts off uh, a lot of uh, an income stream for Islamic State. Uh, we've got to ensure that um, there's a ban of re-entry for people coming back from these war zones. Uh, I know that um, Theresa May wants to relocate these people around the country. There's a huge amount of taxpayers' money going into... Uh, uh, de-radicalisation. Another problem we're facing, and I think it's something that we really do need to uh, uh, look at very carefully, is the uh, whole idea of faith schools. Uh, and another, another Labour idea, I could t I could tie that in with we just discussing about. How the can? Hmm? How, why should we rethink or relook into faith school? Uh, what contribution has it done to ra uh, radicalising? Well, we've we've youth heard, in we've Britain. We first started having faith schools under the Labour regime in about 1998, and there have been um, some a number of issues. You had the Medina School was closed down. There've been a number of issues with regard to. It has nothing to do with radicalisation, has it? The Medina School. I think it did. I think that there were there issues about radicalisation. It's considered to be somewhat a, possibly of a Trojan horse. Another issue we have, there are about 700 unregulated madrasas in the United Kingdom uh, who are processing about over 100,000 children. There was a government report about that stating that there been widespread physical and sexual abuse of children in those madrasas. So clearly there needs to be an issue... In the United Kingdom? No, in the United Kingdom. We do need to focus very carefully on how our, our children are being brought up and what they're being exposed to. They have to be exposed to the national curriculum. They have to be exposed to a whole range of lifestyles and uh, religions. Uh, isn't this view trying to further isolate Muslims from their bigger society, seen as Muslims no, see, are well integrated no, no, into the no, British no, I culture? See it, I see it as the, as the opposite of that. That is a highly, a very inclusive measure. If we don't have people in atomized uh, groups where they're only mixing all the time with their own uh, people, their own uh, religion. They're not uh, expanding or stretching themselves. They're not st expanding their knowledge base, their social base. And we really do need to be uh, an integrated country. And I do think that perhaps the issue of faith schools and certainly the madrasas does need to be looked at. But let's look carefully. at Jihadi John. Jihadi John uh, attended Westminster University. He did. Of which, after the revelations, certain students, uh, former graduates of uh, graduates from Westminster University, are saying the university provide an avenue for extremist preachers, and for that matter, it is a platform for radicalizing students. And we know mm. that Westminster is not a faith university. So how can we link the faith schools, which obviously is basics from primary to secondary how 
what is the well, it, dichotomy? Jihadi John history? may not necessarily been connected. He didn't, I don't think he went to a faith school. But I, from reading about Jihadi John, I understand that um, he came to the United Kingdom from Kuwait. His father was a policeman, and I understand that he had very limited. He, he had very limited English. Obviously, you could tell from the videos now that his English is pretty fluent. But I think during his formative years in school, his English was not that good, and perhaps that led, led him to feel quite isolated. Perhaps he could have done with extra support, perhaps extra tuition to improve his language skills, thus making him feel more integrated. Yeah, uh, I'm going to push back on this. I feel really strongly about this subject, and normally I wouldn't disagree with my erstwhile colleague here on the panel, but I really do think that we are responsible in part for radicalising people. That's certainly what happened in Northern Ireland when the Republican community, who were basically Catholic, felt persecuted by the Unionist community, who were basically Protestant and loyal to the United Kingdom. And <clears throat> these people, I know them personally, they were terrorists. They don't deny they were terrorists. Many of them have committed uh, very serious offences and, and have been in prison for it. But when you talk to them, you can understand why they did it. They don't justify it. They're not saying it was right. Looking back, they know it was wrong. But they say, but this is the reason it happened. Now, I'm seeing history repeat itself again because this country is frightened of saying, actually, we might be responsible for this. Think about this. Think of the hundreds of thousands of civilians that we've killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we always say, well, that's collateral damage. That had to happen to get peace. Four million people marched through Paris when 17 civilians were killed there. 50 world leaders went there. And yet when 70 people have been killed... 15 a, world leaders went there, which, of course, one of them made the same statement that al-Baghdadi made. Benjamin Netanyahu is saying that Europe is no more a safe haven for Jewish people. They should migrate to... Israel. Israel yeah. uh, Al Baghdadi also made a statement before Benjamin Netanyahu said he said all Muslims should join the Islamic State. So these two statements are there any difference between what Baghdadi made and what Benjamin Netanyahu made? Um, I don't have a strong view about that because there was clearly a political agenda in, in, in everyone's words on that day and. I'm happy enough to have that conversation, but perhaps I'm saying too much already, and I want to leave that no, no, no. Essentially, they, they were saying the same thing, but in different ways. That's what I think. Uh, and I think, in, if you look at it more deeply than that, you have to go further than simply those words. What it would be better if people said was, 50 world leaders came to Paris because 17 civilians were killed. Four million people marched through the streets. Why didn't we not react more strongly when 70 people at a wedding were killed in Afghanistan as collateral damage? Why do we not speak more often about the enormous civilian cost of Western foreign policy in Afghanistan and in, uh, to some extent, Syria, because we have had some involvement there, but crucially in Iraq? Imagine if hundreds of thousands of people had been killed in the West by Middle Eastern policy, it'd be completely different. Now, none of that justifies the deaths. All I'm trying to do is appeal to people and any politicians listening to start being a bit more honest with ourselves because we've done all this wrong in Northern Ireland and then we got it right when we started talking and we're doing this wrong in the Middle East. And if we took, close our eyes to it, then we are not guilty of making people kill other people. You have to own that kind of terrible decision yourself. It's on your own conscience. But we have to recognise that we're creating some of the circumstances which will cause certain individuals to make that extreme decision. Well, Mahmoud, an American uh, professor at the University of Massachusetts has made a very good research into how people uh, would want to join any terrorist group in anywhere in the world, including ISIL, by saying that there are two factors. One is external and one is internal. The internal, or the internal one relates to the person and what is going on around the world, the reported events that is going on around the world. And two, the interests of the person joining any terrorist organization in anywhere in this world. So the young Muslim girls and boys leaving the shores of Britain, all the comfort that they've got here to join ISIL. Why do you think someone, your daughter, will leave your comfort home and go to Syria to have a boyfriend, an, an, an ISIL boyfriend or a husband who is a Taliban? I mean, it's, it's a very, very serious, very poignant question. Um, 
And I think this this conundrum we got ourselves didn't just start from now. We start from long time ago when when the war in Iraq took place. Although it is a bit disputed there, but the Tony Blair was clearly told that if you start this war, it will not decrease terrorism, it will increase terrorism, and you will put the British lives of British citizens in danger. Uh, you know, war has a very uh, way of travelling right across the globe. Uh, I actually agree with what Lippert Albeck says. I think in, when you have a serious issue such as that, that affects every one of us. You know, a terrorist act doesn't discriminate. You know, when, when they blew up the bombs on the, on the uh, four places, uh, Old Gate East, I mean, most of that area is Muslim anyway. So, you know, it, it, it affects all of one of the trains that uh, my son travelled on was just a train after that. So my son could have been one of the victims, you know, of this. Um, but the thing is, we have to learn, we have to see how we move forward. The liberal makes very how do you move forward? You, Like I've said before, the mind like an umbrella. You have to open it to see it. And it's very difficult for us to digest that, you know, this is something that we created because these people are not from any other country, they're British people. They're born and bred in Britain. They watch TV programs that, that are English. They go to English schools. They have English friends. They have all of these things. So what makes them turn and flick that switch? What is it that an extremist group can click onto them and turn them into this horrible, hideous thing of creating such vile acts? Uh, I remember when this first started, there were some of the extremist groups coming in, like Ajmoon, all this. I remember the police, the, the, I mean, Elizabeth goes on about madrasas and mosques. Well, believe it or not, madrasas and mosques were actually going to the police saying, look, these groups are dangerous that are being made. They're going to cause us problems. This is not Islam. And what they preach is not Islam coming to the mothers and, and the police took no notice whatsoever until it was too late. Uh, can I also t- talk about the former Madras superintendent? who said about this, uh, the government's anti radicalization strategy is a toxic brand because it's not run by people who understand Islam, understand you. It's run by, again, I do excuse me, the middle-aged white man who have no but do we need to do we need to have people that understand culture of others to combat terrorism in yes Britain? we do why I mean, if we, if we, because if we, when we fought the uh, terrorism in Ireland uh, we need to have people who was Catholic and person who understood who understood the issues and therefore they could communicate on a different level when you have someone who may not have come across a black person or a Muslim person is going to put this very serious job he will be at a loss. I'm not saying anything against him. It's not his fault. I'm just saying the, the way the Labour government and, and that's continued on now has dealt with, with radicalization. Well, we're still tuning into Voice of Africa Radio 27 minutes after 9 o'clock. I'm in the studio with Elizabeth De Rock Jones, uh, Liberal Democrat, Dartford. Parliamentary candidate. UK. UK. <laughs> UK. <laughs> How <dare> that you? <laughs> uh, The rock is going to go to Parliament. Let's hope so. As uh, if the UK and Labour, uh, Liberal Democrat, will vote for her to represent them in the constituency. We will be very glad. Elizabeth, yes. uh, <laughs> the policies of our government has woefully failed us to protect our young people from joining these barbaric people in other parts of the world because we put our noses in their own affairs. For instance, our security services, uh, as it came out the other day, and the avenue to create an enabling environment for a positive discussion is being killed in this country whereby other views are not welcome but when you put in that the terrorists in syria are doing this then everybody will jump on it and talk about it but people like uh, the cage which brought out this issue they were not even listened to immediately the press went for them why don't we have an, a, a, a platform that we can have a positive debate to know the reasons and the causes of all these things so that we can cure it? Why? Well, we already do. I mean, the government's spending about £40 million pound per annum on uh, four strands of prevention. You've got contest, pursue, But I prevent prepare, uh, a former 
Komanda is saying it's a toxic. That's concerning uh, prevent. That's not to yeah. be the other ones are contest, pursue, prepare, protect. And let's face How it. How is it working effectively? Is well, it working? Well, they're going to the community. Uh, they've delivered about 200,000 leaflets in a variety of five different languages, urging people not to go to Syria. Uh, so, you know, they're doing what they can. They're engaging. And let's face it, since... Uh, Elizabeth, do you think uh, d- 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 delivering leaflets is well enough to listen to the view of other people so that you can debate them, give them the opportunity to debate them and know the reason why a 15-year-old girl would want to go and join ISIL fighter in Syria? Well, of course everyone wants to know why. This is why they're spending about £40 million per annum reaching out to the community and speaking to vulnerable uh, people and youngsters to find out what's going on. And uh, frankly, I think most of it is based on fantasy, a distorted view of uh, world politics, a distorted view of world history. It's a fantasy. I don't know if these particular, like these three girls had a particularly um, closeted or oppressive childhood. I don't know. I don't know if they were spoon-fed from a very young age to be hostile towards the uh, non Muslim world to be hostile toward perhaps Israel, to be hostile toward America, if this has been sort of drip fed into them from a very young age, thus making them feel apart from the rest of a society. So they feel they can't really engage fully with all of us and join in because from a very young age their parents have been telling them, oh no, they don't, don't associate with them, they're evil, they did this, they did that, they did this, they don't. We don't know. We don't know what sort of childhood influences. But the parent has also accused the police of not well, alerting easy. them. Well, that's, that's easy to accuse the police. It's always easy to accuse third parties. It's like the people at school whose children aren't doing so well at school. You blame the teacher. You don't look at yourself and think, well, have I actually sat down with my child and read to my child today? Have I sat down and perhaps taught my child to draw or um, told told my child some stories from my life. No, I'll just blame the teacher. No, you can't go around blaming the police. The police, uh, we we should show some respect for the police. I'm sorry, but people really do demand too much of the police. On the one hand, you want them to be Terminator, and on the other hand, you want them to be Mary Poppins. Sure. We need to have a dialogue with what exactly we expect from the police. I'm going to be very civil after this debate, but I can't agree with what you're saying. And it's simply because when... And I'm, I'm speaking from experience here. In Northern Ireland, there are whole sections of the community who really dislike the police because they felt persecuted by them. And it's a fact. The evidence is there. Everything from Bloody Sunday in the early 1970s to the systematic relationship between paramilitaries on the Protestant side and elements of the police. We know this to be the case. Now, yes, why but then, but it's simply not, comp- it's not comparable. There have been... Why is it not comparable? It's not comparable. It's the same, it's not it's the same, it's the same right, event. In what way have the police and, let's say, the security services harassed these, let's say, these three young girls or harassed Jihadi John? Uh, he, they've not been shot. They've not been tortured. All they've probably been done is that they've put, been put under surveillance, and rightly so, from their conduct afterward. What, what are you trying to why say? I, about I, the why why, why would you coerce somebody to work with you if the person is not ready or he's not prepared to work with you? I, I, why should a pressure, enormous pressure be put on somebody to work with yeah. the security service whereas they are not prepared or they, are, they don't want to work with the security service? Well, why don't service? they want to work? What are they hiding? But why yes, because he doesn't want so, to so work with the security service. Mm-hmm. started mm-hmm. coercing you mm-hmm. to uh, be a, a secret informant about your community as Jihadi John claims that he has. Now, I, I haven't got inside knowledge, mm-hmm. but it sounds plausible to me. That would be okay with you. Are you, so, are you seriously that. saying that as a result of the police and the social... Um, that there's not the social security my goodness, uh, the uh, security services are <coughs> pressurising people who they consider to be a high risk to our own personal safety in this country. Are you seriously saying that that resulted in Jihadi John then beheading people? Uh, uh, no, are you minute. seriously wait, wait saying minute, that? Wait a minute. Don't, be, don't make this into a trite conversation. It's not no, trite no, at all. Right. That's what you're saying. It's no, a no, chain no, of consequence no, and that, that is yeah, false. No, you, no, no, according to Jihadi John, you're trying to, you're trying to, to justify something let's that's unjustifiable. No, according to reports, this is, this is Elizabeth, ridiculous. It's yeah. unacceptable because there are two things here. Made it absolutely clear that if people are going to indulge in, in murder and violence, that falls entirely on their shoulders. shoulders. We're not discussing the rights and wrongs of that. I don't think any of the four of us or any of the people listening out there are likely to say that it's okay to do those things. But what I am saying is if you, if you want to understand what's going on, then you leave that si- aside for a minute 
just telling people it's wrong isn't enough. You actually then work out why they got there in the first place. And I'm telling you, I've seen this happen before. I grew up with this in Northern Ireland. And at the moment, I'll tell you, I know another family who are of Muslim faith, and they are in a situation where they've been put under special measures. And the kids were taken away. They are about as radical, frankly as any of us in here, as likely to go to fight in Syria as anyone in here. And I'm telling you, what that does is that creates a distance between the security forces and the police. And on this occasion, actually, some local political members, not, not here, but, but in that part of the country, and them. So, so if we just want to talk about the fashion of it's all wrong and it's all the responsibility of jihadi Jonah and the rest, then we're not going to solve the problem. And one other thing for free, if we are actually going to take this attitude, we need to explain our, our behaviour about civilians in Afghanistan and our behaviour about civilians in Iraq who are, have been killed by us but by as collateral damage and crucially why we gave such mixed messages to people in the UK about whether it was right or wrong to support the, the rebels and the militants who were fighting Assad. And note, a few weeks ago President Assad did a very nice interview on the BBC. Does that mean that actually he's better than the alternative that we were originally backing? According to a report, Assad has refused to speak with uh, Washington, therefore still Assad must go. We will support the moderate uh, 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 terrorist to get rid of Assad before we can form uh, our own opinion. And uh, Assad, the ISIL is the same as Iran, according to Benjamin Netanyahu. So, with all these well, really, unfolding events really and what is... Cheap 5P politician. But let me just get back to the issue that we were discussing. Uh, you know, we need to work together with people and not against people. It's not very long ago that uh, and I'm not going to mention what government it was under, obviously, that police put up cameras that were pointed just at the Muslim community. This happened in this country. If you are, if you commit any crime, you have a right to a lawyer and to be heard in a court. Yet we have a law in this and country so that guilty. allows you to detain people under terrorist laws without any charge whatsoever. Over a thousand Muslims have been detained under that, that have committed no crime. They're not going to have a very positive view of Britain. And how many of those that you think have been charged? None. Under and terrorism law. And when this thing happened, and terrorism, I remember me myself, and that you can find with this I saw with my own eyes. And I could tell you the place, it was a balance sheet in Plasto. Yeah? There was children walking, there were five, six, seven year olds dressed in Muslim gear on the way to the madrasa. The police stopped them and searched them under anti terrorism law. And I intervened because I think that was too much for me to take. And I'm like, you know, this is ridiculous. Have you got nothing better to do? It's all the crime cleared up in New Ham that you have to stop five, six-year-olds under anti-terrorism law. When you treat people like that, you don't build Britain, you divide Britain. Let's mm. not go back to the dark ages. Let's move forward and forward together and build this country for what it once was. Don't forget, it was the Pakistan, what Pakistan didn't exist, it was the Indians, the Kashmiris, the, all of these communities and the Western who fought in the Second World War and saved this country, been overtaken by fascists. Let's not listen and give these fascists a platform here today. Well, are these thoughts tuning into Voice well, of Africa? Can I just thought, are you saying that the police yeah. and the security services are fascists? No, I didn't who, say are the, that. who are these fascists? No, I didn't say that. I who said, are the not fascists? Let the fascists get away Which, who, yeah, but you, hatred. So you're, what, so you're saying then that in fact it's the. Uh, Imams, the hate imams of the fascists. Who are the fascists? Well, if there's an imam that's preaching uh, hate, we, 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 we've been talking report. about who, the hate speech, the hate speech and then uh, the hate speech, but we've, we've not been Anyone able to hate speech is a clearly define what hate speech is, which Theresa May well, is about well, to ban people well, from well, speaking. Any, what? Hate speech is any speech that you make against someone's religion, class, creed, sexuality that will lead someone to commit violence or to degrade them. But that, that, that doesn't satisfy the definition of hate speech because uh, when you say something and you do not ask people that go out and uh, do this, it's not a hate speech. The difficulty I've got with this whole thing is back to... We were discussing definitions earlier on. It's back to definition because many things in this country now are regarded as politically unacceptable to be said because although it isn't possible to introduce a law in a free country which simply bans non-violent extremist comments, because 
you can't define extremism very well. That's entirely subjective. Despite that, we now have a situation which we're playing out in this very debate tonight on your programme, where it's almost suggested that it's unacceptable to suggest that actions by the British authorities, whether the police or whether comments by ministers, could possibly be causing a radicalizing effect. I am one hundred. The question is: Do we tolerate other views? Do we tolerate uh, 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 objective discussion in regards to terrorism or the act of what we are doing elsewhere? In my, in my opinion, we tolerate that conversation until it becomes uncomfortable to the, to the West. We tolerate that until the finger of blame might be pointed at us. They're saying, we can't possibly be responsible. You heard the reaction a minute ago to the suggestion, this ludicrous suggestion, that uh, radicalisation of people, which I think does happen in this country, means that I'm suggesting that the government is responsible for people becoming murderers. I'm not suggesting that, but I am suggesting that, despite the wrongness of that behaviour, we've seen this happen before. And there's this great phrase, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. We're playing this that it's worse on this occasion because we're actually, in my judgment, gave the message we were helping some freedom fighters in Syria against bad Assad. We and helped freedom fighters in Libya, which became ISIL supporters. Then yeah. they became uncomfortable, and now they're the terrorists. I, I believe, I believe that we're not just fighting people who were part of the organisations that we supported. I believe we're actually fighting the actual organizations. So the people we were fighting, we were supporting in Syria, perhaps, are actually connected to the people we're fighting. Two weeks ago, a group of our supporters were disbanded and their weapon is given to ISIL because they are not doing what we want them to do enough. The Americans believe the group in Syria is joined with al-Nusra and ISIL. They are not doing what they are supposed to do to get rid of Assad. So how can we support such a group? We don't, um, we don't want to... Su- UKIP is a, a non-interventionist party. We would seek not to get involved in any way, shape or form. We simply don't have the in-depth knowledge. We ha- don't understand the ever-shifting alliances between tribes, between various religious sects. We just don't understand what's going on. Furthermore, we don't listen. We don't, uh, we don't design an a- exit strategy. There's been no exit strategy. So we are non-interventionist. That said, I do think that in this country there has been a huge amount of discussion and a huge amount of debate about Don't you think it's a huge amount of blames rather than not finding really, a solution really. to the problems? Not really. Because I think if you listen to the media and you read, you can see one way conversation mm. we I don't think it's a one way. I, I don't think it's a one way conversation. I think people genuinely are trying their best to resolve this. So why is Within it that we are not trying to catch law. up with a cage to find out why Cage, Cage is saying Cage that is uh, the Cage security has, services Cage has put had a lot enormous of media pressure attention. on these people Cage to become a, terrorists. Cage has had a lot of media attention. We did not tolerate them. Okay, we, we just did. gave them the... The, the, the attention that well, perhaps, they are, perhaps Cage they are, they are want, allies to ISIL. Well, perhaps Cage doesn't want that much attention because I know Amnesty have now distanced themselves from them. And perhaps if they hadn't had all this attention... It's the same pressure of the media. Well, I don't know. If the media puts a pressure on you, all the organisation will leave you and say you are an ally. Because these situations are so delicate and in, can involve life or death situations, we really don't know what level of information... Elizabeth, do you want me to challenge you? Join mm-hmm. Cage today, do in-depth research get all the emails and have a press conference and say yes this is Britain we need to have insight with the dealings of the security services with uh, Adebalajo with Jihadi John we need to have the truth said tomorrow you'll be on the spotlight and the next day you keep will expel you that you are an ally to the ISIL and terrorist organizations we don't have uh, the toleration or the level of toleration we, we, to discuss this no, issue positively that is further disintegrating we, we, our society. But Cage had a huge amount of media attention. If it were genuinely the case that we do not debate these issues, Cage would not have had the opportunity to be on national television repeatedly. We have all, I'm very sorry, I can't remember his name, but we've all seen the man involved with Cage. We've all heard him describe Jihadi John as a beautiful young man. His former school uh, teacher said he was a beautiful young man, a very good boy we've heard, until yes, he became. That was the statement he made. No, no, I'm saying, no, I'm not saying it's not allowed. What I'm saying is the fact that it's out 
there. The fact that it has been discussed, we I'm, all I'm, heard I'm, the I'm phrases. I'm a bit confused, I so is we, Elizabeth we, Jones accusing this organisation of getting publicity? I'm, no, I'm no. That, it's not confusing at all. What I'm saying, no. What I'm saying, no. What I'm saying is that there is open discussion and open debate about these issues, and that's why Cage has had a lot of exposure recently, and that shows that we are reasonably open because these issues have been aired, and in fact there has been much debate about let, the involvement of the secret service. So what is the reaction of the security services, or what is the reaction well, we of the know. fact Adam, that the right people say the security services is not part of it? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yes. We, we don't hear I want them. the listeners to do something. I want listeners to think in their back of the head, what country does more Farrell come from? Or what country Somalia. is he? He's a right, Somalia. He's, no, you get the game. You're not supposed to tell people, are you? You're supposed to guess it. But how many listeners would actually know that? Do you know why? Because he's British. He's won an Olympic medal. As soon as the Muslim does something wrong, even if they're third generation, they suddenly become a Somalian descendant. Yes, because... Can you imagine how we defranchise? Only last month, a very famous reporter went into a mosque and reported on a tweet that she was turned away and uh, escorted out. When the CCT was released, she had to apologize. Oh, she, she had actually turned up at the wrong mosque, and they were kind enough even to point her to the right mosque. Now, when you have this kind of hatred yeah, yeah, being peddled out, and this kind of one-sided view, yeah. what message does that send out to our youth? I said again, and I said again, let's not preach hatred, let's not pick points, let's, this is a very serious issue that affects all of us, let's not work against one another on political party points, let's work with one another and move Britain forward. Can, can I just add something? If I was, uh, I think that's really good insight from Ahmed. If I was in Wendy Jones' position as UKIP, I would take a slightly different line. I'm not in UKIP, so it's not for me to say. But surely the best thing that UKIP says about this, and something I agree with is we should be an awful lot more cautious before we start intervening in other people's situations. Yes. Now, Wendy has Well, said, we are. Well, Cindy, Wendy has Who wouldn't have intervened in the first place in this yeah. pot? Yeah, well, we wouldn't have had the, this and, and see, hot potato <laughs> but I think in our what, hands. What Wendy's saying that I agree with, and I have before on, on this programme, and I'll leave it for you, the listener, to decide who you agree with, but it seems to me philosophically consistent to say we really do mess this up a lot and you could, could take a quite a big win from that the difficulty is and all the muslims who vote you keep yeah <laughs> well, quite possibly but it's not just that Pe- people who actually understand the story might be more uh, sympathetic to that you position now the other just the other simple point i tend to be non-interventionist myself but there's a contradiction here and i'm just putting it out there on the one side that's a good position on the other side the consequence of that is when we do intervene bad things happen so you could easily say what i'm saying saying well we don't want to be involved because this leads to bad results and we don't do it well anybody who wants to understand this further there's a film called charlie wilson's war it's actually about how the west particularly america supported the mujahideen which was a precursor to al-qaeda al-qaeda and, and basically we used them to destroy the russian presence in afghanistan but once that was achieved, we walked away. Another Calmly. classic example of where we got it wrong. Another classic but example of what happened in Libya. We Pakistan went there, we well. saw him, and we killed him. One then there was a smile from him. Just Mrs. Clinton. One of our greatest allies. Mahmoud, uh, we have another topic well. to discuss this evening. I think uh, voters will How just... How did we destroy Pakistan? has got a population of about 140 million. <laughs> we have to we have to, end, we have to end this discussion. And still you end this one. <laughs> We, we will end this on Pakistani well, note, and then the next that. time we shall discuss Pakistan with the atomic uh, energy. They have atomic weapon, and yet Pakistan is one of the most destroyed country in the Asian yes, uh, or South Asian uh, subcontinent. Uh, Migration, immigration in the United Kingdom. Uh, another in, uncontroversial subject. Then. Yes. Right. In 2011, Mr. Cameron made a very wonderful uh, statement, a speech, and he said it will be reduced to tens and thousands. There is no ifs or buts. We shall reduce it. So now, I think posterity should judge Mr. Cameron come May election if he has been able, on a single promise of reducing immigration, to uh, make provision for our schools, NHS, and other services in United Kingdom. The current uh, net migration is two. 
uh, is 298,000, uh, out of which 162,000 from the EU member states and uh, 190,000 from non-EU member states, year ending September 2014. Uh, Limbid. Before Elizabeth takes on uh, <laughs> the immigration in the United Kingdom, Mr. Miliband did not make a lot of noise about it because he doesn't want to be seen as an uh, anti-immigration leader in the United Kingdom. What is your take on it? My take is that David Cameron made a promise he couldn't keep and it was never possible to keep it. The terrible mistake he made on this one, and it's bigger than usual, he's quite a good operator, but on this one, he said no ifs, no buts, as you rightly reminded us, and then there was an if and there was a but. They've got it terribly wrong. This plays beautifully into the hands, not of Labour, because Labour are in the same sort of situation, uh, but into UKIP's hands. And you know what they've done? They've started accusing Nigel Farage of doing a U-turn because he said we don't keep it down to 50,000 a year. Well, you know what? What's wrong with changing your position if the facts change? It would be silly for Farage to pretend he could do 50,000 a year. Farage has said he doesn't need to put a cap on it, but he'll go the Australian way, point system. Yeah, you see, that's quite interesting because the point system does seem to work quite well for Australia, and there's a real debate to be had there. But I think that you could play this quite well. So while I'm going to be very critical of what uh, uh, Wendy... Uh, 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 what Elizabeth. Yeah, I know. I was just about to say Wendy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That's how angry I am, and even getting a name mixed up. What Elizabeth said earlier on about the other subject, on this one, if... UKIP don't allow themselves to be pushed around by the fashion and media, they could actually end up looking like pretty good players. Interesting that Liberal Democrats haven't really got very involved in the conversation. I hope they will in about 10 seconds' time. Uh, but this has really been a, a, an argument which is most dangerous for David Cameron and potentially most advantageous for Farage, as long as he can make these points in ways that don't look racist. But, uh, Elizabeth... Yes, Adam? Seen us now, the UK policy on yes. immigration, mm -hmm. uh, Nigel Farage has stated it clearly yes. that the traditional allies of Britain, which is Commonwealth, yes, the Commonwealth, they are not going to say they wouldn't allow any Commonwealth member to come to the United Kingdom, but there is a criteria to be fulfilled, which is the point system. The British the British want the best out of the lot. So if you are going to have a visa, you have to prove that you are worth coming into the United Kingdom, whereby you'll be more contributive or you'll be of a beneficiary to the society that you are joining in. Now, well, it doesn't quite work like that, but please continue, Adam. Now, uh, no ifs, no buts. Net migration is shot up 298,000 mm -hmm. under the Conservative administration. Mr. Cameron said he will bring it back to from 1990s to uh, 1980s to 1990s. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think voters should do to Mr. Cameron and the Conservative administration? Seen as he did not keep his promise. Although Vichy, they should vote him out. I mean, it's and what is the nonsense. alternative well, to voting UK him it. out? You keep, vote you keep. And what are you going to do? Well, I, okay, it's an absolute lie. I, I need to repeat this. I'm, I'm canvassing on a very regular basis now. And, you know, it, I, I find it so heartening when I speak to the public because the public have certainly now grasped the fact that we have a two-tier immigration system in this country. And um, I was out um, Saturday, Sunday, and Sunday had a long conversation with a midwife in Dartford. And she was telling me, she said, well, you know, why does he say these things? Does he think we're absolutely stupid? Does he think we don't know that there's freedom of movement in the EU? And there's, does he think we don't know that he can do nothing whatsoever to stop EU members coming to live here? And that's right, it's got through. It's got through. I think everyone now understands that he's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, a little a little man hiding behind this big facade. We're all on to him now. We all know it's rubbish. Uh, you, as you were just saying, September 2014, net migration figures, 298,000, uh, 190,000 outside the EU. It has to be made quite clear that he simply has no control over EU migration. None at all. None at all. And as for the Conservatives, 
thinking that they can enter into any negotiation whatsoever to change that. No, it's not going to happen. The Treaty of Rome 1957 platform policy was that there should be freedom of movement throughout the EU. And uh, Angela Merkel has made it quite clear that that is a fundamental. She will not, I repeat, she will simply not negotiate. It's, it's absurd. I, I mean, it's just absolutely absurd. To, I don't even know why he says these things. Does he think we're so stupid? Does he think that the electorate is, is so... Most of us are state-educated, perhaps we're not as uh, sharp as he is. I don't know what it, where it comes from. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But if I could just return to the immigration situation. What we want is an immigration system just like the Australian system very similar to the Immigration Rules 2014 under the uh, Immigration Act 2014 where you have various tiers. For instance, you have Tier 1, you've got exceptional talent, you have exceptional entrepreneurs, uh, you have general migrants with um, (coughs) skills we need, you have the entrepreneurial, you have students and you have temporary workers. So the full range of people that we need to make our economy sustainable and wealthy can be provided for within the immigration rules. We don't just want the, the, like the superstars. But you couldn't provide uh, another policy during your recent uh, Which policy? conference. You haven't been able to put up your uh, manifesto during your recent. Uh, well, a lot of it's already. A lot of it has gone up. A lot of our, for instance, we've got the business about the um, foreign aid. At the moment, foreign aid is not point. So, what is the current seven. policy on immigration? Do you keep current policy on immigration? Current policy on immigration. If you just bear with me, I had all my bits and pieces here. All right. Current UKIP policy is to have a point style system for entry. Uh, we want to bring net migration down. 2010 to policy. To, to, yeah, well, it's the same. It's more or less the same. There, there is very little difference. To tr- endeavour to bring net migration down to about 50,000 per annum. Clearly, you cannot have a fixed figure. So how can you person. bring the net migration down to 50,000 per annum? What are the because we'll be, steps that because you we keep won't follow? Be, because we'll be leaving the EU. But Therefore, we won't have the, the but huge you, you you policy in. anymore. <laughs> It shouldn't be, but that's what? not your policy. Well, our, policy is to, our, policy, our policy is to leave the EU. It's no, 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 that is, but not the 50,000. Oh. But until you leave no, the EU... Saying, no, we wouldn't... No, we wouldn't... That's why you're holding on to... No, OK, risky, we are... We are policy. No, we... we we would be aiming for around about that. Clearly, you cannot have a threshold figure because, for instance, let's say if you did have a fixed a fixed figure, and let's say one person turns up, Joe Joe Bloggs from you know I'm just Mr. Whatever, I know a pretty ordinary sort of person. You know, perhaps you need them for occasional work. I don't know, and they take the last the last slot and the migration threshold list, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this outstanding eye surgeon, just the person we want. But you can't have him in, because the... the, uh, the thing well, Mahmoud, now, the immigration policy, you haven't said much. You give us a little bit said. No, uh, Liberal Democrat um, hasn't said much. You know, sometimes we say quite a lot, but just saying quiet and listening to what the people have to say. Uh, you can learn a lot by listening. Uh, as your esteemed listeners are doing now, what we're going to look at really to understand is look at the immigration pattern in the UK. And if we don't go too far back into the dark ages, but we just start from recently, let's say the 1950s, when uh, people from West Indies, Africa and Asia were encouraged to come into this country to build this country up after the Second World War. And we needed manpower, labour power. Uh, recently, we stopped investing in the apprenticeships in the last two governments of the Tory and Labour. We had, when we wanted to build schools, housing, we had no plumbers, builders, but we had plenty of people with degrees and media studies, but nobody that could actually do the work we needed. So these East Europeans who are being now sort of um, demonised were actually needed. They contributed £8.5 billion by 2011. This is not a Lib Dem figure, this is University College of London research and study. Yeah, on migration. After you take their benefits of what they've used, we are still left with £4.96 billion. That this country, me, Limpet, Elizabeth and you, Adam, are better off by having them in the country. Why must we always look at the negatives? Let's look at the positives. What immigration has done to this country. Point system is a good idea. But let's, let's lower the listeners. Let us ask them. You was an immigrant. Did you come under point system? Did you harm this country? Did you build this country? Did you contribute to this country or not? I think every 
contrib- immigrants we've had in the country have contributed to this country, made it what it is, and built it what it is. Now, uh, you mentioned but that, where, uh, where was Lib- the Lib- Liberal Dem- Democrat, that your senior coalition partner, had that uh, policy statement, made right. that wonderful now, if speech? If you, what I want, where was Liberal to, Democrat? What, what I want the listeners to do is very easy. Don't take my word for it. Just Google Liberal Democrats. You'll go straight onto the page. Have a look. And what we have said is that. You see, last Labour government, what did they actually took out the exit uh, figures? So you knew how many people were coming in, and you scare the people, but you never actually told them how many were coming out because guess what? You didn't even know yourself. What we will do is put introduce exit checks back again, so we're talking with an educated and true figure. <laughs> Try not purely cut immigration for sake of, you know, pleasing. Some people who may not understand the issue of how immigration I think would be wrong, but also you can. So, have is the, U- uh, the so liberal democratic policy is going to be you. against to the non EU? Because EU, they right. can come, the legal migrant can come in. Like the Labour time. Party did from EU was also wrong, is also wrong. So, we need to take a good educated, but before we do that, we need to have input and output. How many people are coming in? How many people are going in? And let's not remember, there's millions of British people living abroad as well. I was at the property debate show, as you know, are dealing properties. And you'd be surprised how many English people were actually buying property to buy to immigrate. And we know that 1.5 million English people live in Spain now. So there is, it's not as simple as you would have you believe. There's two sides to each argument. Well, you still tuning to Voice of Africa Radio. Pretty soon, our time will be up. Elizabeth, yes, Adam. Be snappy with yes, your of course. Well, that was that was clear as mud. Thank you. I would, uh, it sounds to me that you're more or less uh, <laughs> supporting an open door migration policy. <laughs> no, we are an island. We have limited resources. Uh, we're reaching a situation where um, people aren't getting their first choice of schools. People are taking a long time to get GP appointments, a long time to get hospital appointments. It's taking a long time for them actually to drive to hospitals and to get parking places. Isn't it all about capital investment that the it's country not just must, be, must embark upon by the benefit they accrue from the migrants coming to work in the United Kingdom? It, it, I, I see it more or less as some kind of Ponzi scheme. However, it's a huge burden on our infrastructure. We don't have the money in place. And um, it's all very well saying about, yes, it's accepted that migration has brought great riches to the country. However, at the current level, it's unsustainable. And from 1997 to about 2010, Labour, as you know, brought in, I think it's about two-thirds of the current migration figures we have now. I think it's about uh, two-thirds, about it three was points. two million, two, it's, two it's a very large amount. million. Yeah. And of course, we also got to consider about national security, national happiness, and really long-term, what uh, benefit this will bring and what loyalty the people coming in will have to us in this country. Uh, Migration Watch has done a great deal of um, s- s- in-depth study about this and in fact stated that the we don't take into account the huge burden on health care costs, burden on uh, social care systems, education system, and indeed the prison service as well. So these are issues that aren't often added in when people are giving a really glowing picture toward migration. Migration has to be appropriate, it has to be useful, and it has to be relevant. It yeah. can't just be ideological. My, my, well, limit. my suspicion is, though, that uh, this is one time when UKIP have the capacity to play a pretty good game here. But, but don't you think the story is dying slowly? UKIP is not uh, drumming home their demand on I, the migration. I, Therefore, the story is dying. It came last week, the net migration has gone up, conservative hasn't been able to do anything. Yeah, th- th- I, think, I think the position I would take, which is different to what Elizabeth said, is it, this is what I would say. This is what I would say of Faz Farage. Yes, of course, we've changed our position. We now have a more sophisticated position based on the realities, but we would introduce a point system like Australia because that's worked there. Whether you agree with that or not, Adam, it's a plausible position. And I just feel that this is an open goal between Nigel Farage and David Cameron. This is the kind of thing that probably is frightening David Cameron into not wanting to have a debate. It should depend on his two eyes in the House of Parliament to ask uh, Mr Cameron to debate him on migration. He, he could do, but in the whole of the Conservative Party now, I think Mapu made a courageous and probably accurate description of the Lib Dem 
sympathy for migration, basically. It may not be a very popular position, but when you're on 8% in the polls, you haven't got much to lose, so you might as well tell the truth. Well, Mahmoud. <laughs> well, it's the first time we've seen a politician actually uh, get accused of telling the truth. <laughs> Limpet, <laughs> you are welcome, sir. <laughs> but, you know, it's not the first time. Don't forget, under the Labour government, we used to uh, detain innocent children because their children are migrants. It was the Liberal Democrats that took that away. We're not third world country. Let's not make third world laws in this in this country. There are still Let's children in the detention centres. There were t- t- children for migrants were arrested yes. when they came in, were detained. It is now the Liberal Democrats that were when come one the first public did was stop the detention of children. And well, quite, quite right, and let's also make sure that immigration levels aren't such that they make our wages in this country depressed to third world levels. Well, I thank you all very much for your time with we us. Just on. started, we're just warming <laughs> up. <laughs> 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 we can't another hour. Voice yeah. of Africa Radio, it's been a wonderful day today. Uh, Elizabeth the Rock Jones, thank you, Adam. The, uh, you keep uh, that Ford uh, parliamentary candidate, Mahmoud thank Fez, you Liberal us. Democrat, Latin and Wanted, also human rights activist and uh, an expert in South Asian politics. I have also Limbid Opec, former uh, parliamentary candidate on the ticket of Liberal Democrat this evening with me in the studio. I thank you all for listening to this program. Stay tuned and don't go away. Catch us same time next week between 7 and 8. Thank you and see you later.